if you use mouthwash, you kill the nitrate reducing bacteria and you now you don't get the benefits of eating a good diet. And think about this. I mean, people people mostly have good intentions, right? They try to learn as much as they can. They try to listen and, and, and assimilate all the information they're getting bombarded with on TV, the media, advertising. And you see the commercials. Wake up every morning, use Listerine, use Scope. It kills 99.99% of the bacteria in your mouth. Well, that's not a good thing. You know, we and others have published that if you use mouthwash, your blood pressure goes up and you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise and you lose the benefits of eating a, a healthy diet. So the worst thing you can do is use mouthwash. And I try to put this in perspective because most people, this is kind of like the aha moment for a lot of people. They go, oh, well, I'm doing damage by using mouthwash? Yes. The, we've known for many, many decades that you don't take an antibiotic every day for the rest of your life, right? If you've got an infection, you take a regimen of antibiotics, 7, 10, 14 days, and then you stop. You kill the bad guys, but you don't continue to take antibiotics because of the collateral damage. It's mostly non-selective killing, right? So we're killing the bad guys, but we're also killing the good guys. And there are a number of problems that occur from that. We kill the gut bacteria, you get gut dysbiosis, you get systemic disease. Well, the same thing happens in your mouth. When you kill the oral microbiome in your mouth every day, sometimes twice a day, there's consequences to that. And the number one consequence is it shuts down nitric oxide production, causes an increase in blood pressure, you lose the benefits of exercise, and you can no longer get nitric oxide from this secondary pathway. So I tell people all the time, look, if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. I mean, the risk-benefit kind of quotient there is all risk, no benefit. So you have to stop. And then the other important thing that a lot of people don't even consider either is fluoride. You know, most toothpaste have fluoride, and fluoride is put in toothpaste because it kills bacteria. It's an antiseptic. So you have to get rid of fluoride in your toothpaste. The other major problem is most municipal water systems are fluorinated. They put fluoride in the water, in the drinking water. Why? To kill the bacteria. So now when you're drinking the water, you're killing the good bacteria, you're killing the bad bacteria, you're shutting down your thyroid function, and fluoride's a neurotoxin. So we have to rid our body of fluoride. I want to highlight the importance of this second step here. The fact that we have these bacteria on our tongue, and if we're killing them through things like fluoride or mouthwash, we're limiting this whole second pathway. And we already know that the first pathway is going to decline naturally as we age. So I can only imagine the number of people that are getting older, their first pathway is degraded down, and they're using something like mouthwash or even drinking unfiltered water and getting fluoride and killing that bacteria And then you clarify if I'm wrong, but as far as I know from preparing and reading your book and and digging into your work, there is only these two pathways. So if you're impacting them both in a negative way, the first one just by, you know, we talked about living a healthy lifestyle helps accentuate that, but aging is going to dampen it naturally. It's so easy to mess this up is what I'm getting at. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, it seems like I said, everything we do from an American lifestyle is designed to shut down nitric oxide production. Now what happens? Your blood pressure goes up. That's the number one risk factor for the number one killer of men and women worldwide, which is cardiovascular disease. Nitric oxide is important for insulin signaling. So you develop insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. You start to develop mild cognitive disorders and vascular dementia, eventually Alzheimer's. You don't have the energy to exercise because your mitochondria aren't producing enough energy. So everything we know about the onset and progression of age-related chronic disease can be traced back to insufficient nitric oxide production. Then so people have to ask yourself, well, what am I doing to disrupt my nitric oxide production? Well, you're not getting enough vegetables. You're not getting enough nitrate. Two out of three Americans use mouthwash every morning. And not coincidentally, two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. And think about this. If you have high blood pressure, you go to your doctor and he puts you on a blood pressure medicine, Right? And 50% of the people that are on blood pressure medicine don't respond with better blood pressure. We call this resistant hypertension. It's resistant to standard pharmacotherapy. So why is that? Well, these drugs aren't targeted towards the oral microbiome. There's ACE inhibitors that, that uh, you know, mechanistically they're affecting the angiotensin converting enzyme, shutting down uh, ANG2 production. 
There's calcium channel antagonists. There's uh, beta blockers, diuretics. So the reason that these patients are resistant to standard therapy is because it's the wrong target. They don't have a renin-angiotensin problem. They don't have a calcium dysregulation. They don't have a fluid imbalance. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel antagonists, and diuretics aren't going to affect their blood pressure. Hypertension is a symptom of oral dysbiosis. So now we're finding if you're using mouthwash and you stop and allow this microbiome to repopulate and do its job, blood pressure will normalize, and now you can get off medications. And Americans, especially older Americans, are over-medicated. They're put on one medication, two, three, four. I know people who are on 10, 12, 15 different medications. And the human body cannot and will not heal or perform when there's that many synthetic enzyme inhibitors at one time. I mean, that's not how the human body is designed to work. Okay, so for the person tuning in here, they're one of the two-thirds of Americans that have been using mouthwash to this point. They're going to stop today, but now they're worried that they've killed the good microbiome in their mouth. What do they do? How can they accentuate bringing that back? I'm assuming there's a way. And then how long does it take? You know, we published on this, I think, in, we published a, a similar paper in 2019. And we designed this experiment to answer that question. So we took normal, healthy individuals that had normal blood pressure. And for seven days, we just used mouthwash twice a day. And at the end of seven days, we measured their blood pressure. We did tongue scrapings to figure out what well, before and after, see what happened to the oral microbiome. And then we stopped the mouthwash for four days. And then after four days, let's see what happens to their blood pressure. And let's see what happens to the microbiome. So the results of that study were after seven days of using mouthwash in otherwise normal tense of patients, we saw an increase in blood pressure. In fact, in one person, we saw a 21 millimeter increase in blood pressure. 21-year-old triathlete dental student. His blood pressure went up 21 millimeters of mercury in one week just by killing the bacteria in his mouth. No change in diet, no change in uh, exercise activity. The only thing we did was kill his bacteria, and we made him clinically hypertensive. And then fortunately, once we stopped, four days later, the microbiome had completely repopulated and his blood pressure completely normalized. So this population is really resilient in the fact that if you stop killing it daily, it repopulates. We just got to give these bugs kind of what they need. So number one, get rid of fluoride, get rid of mouthwash, and then start eating more green leafy vegetables because these are what we call nitrate reducers. They're facultative anaerobic bacteria, meaning that if oxygen's around, they can respire on oxygen. If oxygen's not around, then they respire on nitrate. So the more nitrate-rich vegetables you you consume, we're feeding these bacteria a normal respiratory substrate that they can rely on and respire on, and they'll repopulate. And the beauty about that is, what we also published in that study, that the greater the diversity of the oral microbiome, the healthier the microbiome, and the better management of blood pressure. So we need diversity. There's biofilms, there's different communities on the dorsal part of the tongue, on the gingival tissue. So the, the, the ecology in the mouth is, is quite remarkable, but it's very resilient. So even if you've been using mouthwash for months or years, once you stop, at least the data from our study, published study shows that within four days, these bacteria will completely repopulate now you just got to feed them, feed them the good stuff. All right. So we know from before we touched on this quickly, the fact that the bacteria on the tongue feed on nitrates and they can feed on them as food is being chewed and, and before it's swallowed. And then also there's a secondary system, thankfully, that digests and then brings the nitrates back up through the saliva. And then we get a second chance at feeding those bacteria. No, and that's kind of the, the second, what we call a time release. So now each time you secrete, you, you salivate, you're secreting nitrate in the saliva. And this is a very inefficient system. So we can quantify this. So the, the nitrate that's, let's, let's call it, we eat 150 grams of spinach salad. 90 minutes after we consume that, the nitrate that's in that spinach, only about 25% of that's going to be taken up in the gut. Right, so about a third, about a fourth of the load that you're getting from the diet is taken up in the gut and then concentrated in our salivary glands. The rest is distributed throughout the circulation, filtered through the kidneys. You excrete some, some is reabsorbed. And then only about 20%, you only get about 20% reduction efficacy of the bacteria in the mouth. So each time you salivate. So 25% absorption, 
uh, 20% reduction, that's 5% of the total nitrate load we're reducing into or metabolizing into nitrite and nitric oxide. So, and we, we've quantified that. We can, we can verify it stoichiometrically. I mean, this is a very beautiful system. So I think it's an inherent inefficiency because it allows the body to produce nitric oxide over a long period of time in a time-release manner, provided that we have normal salivary secretion, we have normal uh, nitrate-reducing bacteria on the crypts of the tongue, and that our parietal cells in our stomach can produce stomach acid. Okay, so we know when it comes to the bacteria in the mouth, you've mentioned fluoride, mouthwash, those are both going to kill it. What about things like gum people are chewing, um, tongue scraping? I'm just trying to think of different inputs into the mouth and how they might benefit or cause damage there to the, to the microbiome. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of unanswered questions still. So f- for the most part, there's a lot of, you know, the answer is we don't know. But here's what we do know. Tongue scraping, in that same study, we found that people who did daily tongue scrapings had the greatest diversity of the oral microbiome and had the best blood pressure. But if you tongue scraped and used mouthwash, those were the patients who had the greatest increase in blood pressure upon mouthwash. So that our, our interpretation of that data was, if you do tongue scraping and don't use mouthwash, that seems to be very beneficial. And I, th- I, I equate it to like tilling the soil, right? When you t- scrape the tongue, you're basically kind of tilling the soil and, 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 and kind of allowing these, these organisms and bacteria to repopulate and diversify. And that seems, at least in our study, to have better blood pressure management. Um, things like chewing gum, I think it depends on if it's sugar, uh, a lot of sugar in the gum, then, you know, sugar causes an overgrowth of, you know, acid producing uh, bacteria in the mouth and caries and cavities and, and bad things. There's other things like essential oils uh, that we don't have any interest to, things like oil pulling. I get questions all the time, and these are things that we just don't know. We haven't researched it. But unless it's antiseptic and kills non-selective bacteria, the good, the bad, then I think it's probably going to be fine. If, if, it's, if it's antiseptic, it's not going to be good. If the oral hygienic practice isn't killing any bacteria, like tongue scraping isn't killing anything, it's just kind of allowing a disturbance of the of the uh, terrain. Um, so yeah, I think you know again, there's a lot of answers that we don't have, but what we do have, it's very clear that you can't use antiseptic mouthwash, you can't add fluoride to your to your body in any capacity whatsoever, and then just eat a balanced diet in moderation with some more green leafy vegetables and. Sometimes it's really that simple. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. For me, it's no wonder why we have the sickest population on the planet. Everything we do is disrupting nitric oxide production. If you can't make nitric oxide, you're going to develop chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic fatigue. If you use mouthwash...